All the content contained in this webcast is for informational purposes only. The investments and strategies contained in this webcast may not be suitable for you. Please consult your own independent financial advisor before making any investment or trading decisions. Good morning, traders and investors around the world, and welcome to Monday, June 11th, very special edition of PremarketInfo.com. As it's Dennis's 36th birthday. Congratulations. Uh -oh. 36 calls are in the money. The 36 calls are in the money. You can feel free to sell the 35 puts there, Joel. I'm feeling old today, too. I'm tired this morning. Old and tired. Not good. Not good. No. Well, we got a jam-packed show here for you today, folks. Uh, all kinds of crazy activity in the S&Ps, Dennis. Look, lo and behold, I write a uh, bullish uh, weekly outlook, and we hit 1342 in the pre-market. We were flying here earlier, Joel. Crazy. We've given back a lot of the gains, so, so like at 4 a.m. or even overnight, if you were looking at the session when it opened, we were up as much as uh, seven, or actually as much as 20 points there, Joel. We're only up five now, so this market got real giddy on this uh, Span Spain bailout here, and it's given back a lot of the gains. Okay, had some late breaking news on Friday regarding Facebook and UBS. Yeah, we did, Joel. I guess UBS came out and saying that they may have lost as much as $350 million. Those numbers haven't been verified from the full Facebook debacle on the first day. So they were contemplating maybe taking action against NASDAQ for those losses. But this is something, you know, it's been bothering me. All these, you know, market makers, all these major companies coming out and saying, look, technical glitches cost us money, pay us. I'll tell you, Joel, from as a trade perspective if I added up every time a technical glitch cost me money I'd be getting paid some money too and if you have little retail guy uh, Joe investor complaining you know that a technical glitch cost him money I doubt very highly that the NASDAQ would, you know, even consider paying them. They, you, you sign disclaimers and stuff, but because these UBS and you know, Knights and Citadels all are huge customers, they cater to them, Joel. Yeah, there's a couple interesting points about this, and from what I read, you never know what exactly happened, but the trader sent a large order, and he didn't get a fill, okay? Okay. So he didn't get a fill, so he hit the button again, and then he hit it again, and he still wasn't getting fills. So number one rule out there to our listeners, if you're trading in crazy markets, and you enter an order, and you don't get a fill... You almost have to assume your fill, but don't keep hitting that buy button because you, exactly the same thing is going to happen to you as happened to uh, UBS, and you're going to get stuck with the stock. It's just it's it's unbelievable that they would be. You know that that poor of risk management and something like that. Yeah, Joel, this is something. Um that I've actually seen happen with me over the years is exactly that. Sometimes you'll press the button and you'll get a pop-up message and it'll say uh, order status unknown. As soon as you get that, you've got to almost assume you're filled. So, and I, and maybe it's the computers that are trading and they just keep pressing the buy button. You just don't know. You know, with 80, 90 percent of the high frequency, being high frequency volume now, it could just be the computers that keep pressing the buy button thinking that they're not filled and they want to cover and continuing to press it because they haven't got the confirmation back. So maybe that's why these losses are so high as well. So, uh, but if you're going to take on these kind of risk, then you know, the, then <laughs> you're going to have some days like this where technical glitches can cost you money. These companies, and especially if the stock is falling. If the stock is falling, if you send a buy order, you don't get an execution. And that, I mean, that, there were very few rallies in Facebook on that first day. Why keep hitting the buy button? Yeah, exactly. Just don't keep hitting it. And that's a good rule for all you traders out there. When you don't get a confirmation back, call your brokerage, find out what's happening with that order, because uh, and assume that you might be filled on it. So don't hit it seven, eight times, because you might get seven, eight times more stock than you want. But. Yeah, also, also with uh, with UBS, I mean, last time they had a trading debacle like this, it was like two and a half billion. So this one was only three hundred and fifty million. They're actually doing better on their risk management. <laughs> UBS. Anyways, the chart doesn't uh, look that bad. Actually, the stock's trading up a few cents, probably just on the whole Spain deal uh, being worked out. So it's not a material loss here for UBS. It just kind of, you know, gripes us that these big companies can 
fight and get money back when Joe Investor probably has no chance to get anything back on a technical glitch. But stock is actually trading up $0.03, cents, so I don't think this is really going to materially affect UBS. Uh, Facebook itself actually trading down again, though, Joel. The stock has obviously uh, not been pretty here for quite some time. I know you were bullish earlier. Are you starting to get or bearish or bullish, or what are you on this? Well, Dennis, I think there's a very, very interesting formation coming up here in Facebook that everyone should pay attention to. Uh, you've had a cluster of highs here in the high 27s, 27.76 was Friday's high. Then going back another couple days, you had a 27.76 high again, coupled with a 27.65 high. Let's just call that whole area 28 bucks. Until Facebook can get above and hold 28 bucks, you got to be leaning to the short side. But that's a setup there. You get some news, maybe you break over that level. I think Facebook may be, uh, may be on its way up. Looking at the UBS chart, I mean, this stock just hasn't moved a whole lot. Uh, it's come down from 1450, hit 11 bucks, had a nice pop along with the market, hit 12. Uh, looking at that mid-range, 1150, that should be good support. But for the stock really to rally, Dennis, it's got to clear that $12 level. A lot of other European banks were up a lot this morning. We had Deutsche Bank trading up significantly. Barclays BCS was up over 5%. Obviously, STD, one of your uh, Banco Santander, a bank directly in Spain, was up significantly as well. These stocks are not up nearly as much as they were, though. It's, uh, STD only up 10 cents now. Um, if Joe can maybe go find these after hours highs for you on a few of these stocks. But at 4 a.m. this morning, these things were all up 4, 5, 6%. Now they're up about 1%. I don't know if that bodes overall well, or is this just a pullback that we should be buying? Uh, Banco Santander did hit 645 in the pre-market, coincides with the 640, 644 high that we had on May 10th. Mm -hmm. So 650 is major resistance. Uh, since hitting that number, it's come back, it's traded down as low as 612 so let's keep an eye on basically the six buck level the 650 level uh, but there weren't a lot of trades up there at 650 that's gonna be major resistance to so maybe maybe the deal is not as good as people thought it was yeah uh, you know, I you almost expected it you heard rumors even Friday during the regular session something like this might happen over the weekend and then we pop 17 18 20 s p points off of that so maybe it's not shocking it was a lot of air maybe it's not shocking especially after the run that we've had. I mean, the S&P has been on a huge run here, so maybe not surprising that you do get some profit taking um, because basically in five sessions, you know, I think the S&P, if I'm not mistaken, had its best week of the year last year. And then following through with another 20-point move overnight, some people were probably licking their chops to try to take some of those gains. What do you think that these people that are like, obviously, there's obviously sellers here at 1340, 1341, 1342. I mean, what do you think they're basing? Their, I mean, you think they're getting out of longs, initiating shorts off fair value calculations? I mean, what do, what do you think? Is it bots up that late at night? Oh, the bots are up 24 hours a day. They don't get sleepy <laughs> like I do, Joel. So, the, but that being said, I don't think, uh, it's really hard to say. Everybody's got a different reason to be trading. That's why we have a market. But 1342 is, you know, you just got to keep an eye on these technical numbers because once they put a high in place, that number then becomes relevant because people are looking at those numbers on the charts and it almost becomes like a self fulfilling prophecy. That's why we always look at lows, we look at highs, we look at closes because those numbers go into other algorithmic technical formulas as well. And sometimes those highs can hold up and sometimes it just happens to be some huge institutional seller there that's just dumping a huge position too, especially on individual issues when you see a stock top out two three four times especially near a whole number it's often because it's just a huge institutional seller there yeah i mean i'm looking at the 1342 level uh, if you go to our s&p numbers i had a high on may 15th at uh, 1340 i mean i imagine if i was up in the middle of the night and uh, you know long the s&ps i probably would have you know used that as an exit but you know, when they get going like that, I mean, who in the world knows, you know, if it's actually a short at that level. Right. But that's a good point. Go back, look at the charts, and look at your levels. And a lot of times, that's where either the index or the individual stocks uh, will stop. Will stop. 
Bank America, Joel has had a quite the range here this morning too. We'll let we'll let Joel find out that after hours high. But it's trading 773 right now, so it's getting a lift off of this too. I know Goldman Sachs was trading higher as well. It's traded um, up to 95.84 here right now. So the U.S. financials are actually, believe it or not, performing better than the European financials. Yeah, the uh, Bank America uh, ran into some trouble just short of that $8 level on uh, on Thursday. We were talking about that. It was trading that near the pre-market. It actually had a pretty nice sell-off yesterday uh, on Friday down to seven twenty. Uh, look at the pre-market range here, Dennis. Someone is making a stand here at seven sixty-five. That's a gap up from yesterday. Uh, keep a real close eye on that level. Going back on the upside, Dennis, uh, this thing is probably going to start taking another shot at that $8 level. It probably is. Um, is there any other financials you want to make a note here, Joel? Morgan Stanley, I know they're all trading higher than U.S. financials. Uh, just that Morgan Stanley, I mean, we talked about that area that it got close to. It uh, got under 12 bucks. Uh, just unbelievable. They get quite under 12. It got to 12.26. We talked about that 11.58 low. That was the October low. I mean, theoretically, it's a low-risk buy down here, Dennis. I mean, if you want to use that 11.50 as a stop-out level, if you have some confidence in Morgan Stanley here, uh, here's a chance to maybe pick something up on the cheap. That's scary, though. 13.89 to 11.50. That looks like a lot of risk to me. I'd rather get this thing around 12 bucks, but I don't know if that's going to happen or give you a shot. These things definitely have been obviously had a fantastic week. Wouldn't surprise me if there is some follow through, but there's going to be some profit taking these things too. I just don't think you should chase these kind of stocks when they're up 20% in a week. Wait for a pullback because often you'll get a second chance. Wouldn't surprise me if we do, you know, have a, a breather anyways where these stocks do start to pull back a bit because they've had a heck of a run. Uh, but speaking of like picking bottoms, what we were talking about on Friday was McDonald's, Joel. We loved that 86 level. The stock actually did almost exactly what you said it would. Trades right through the level, gets down to 85.92. And this is something for you traders to keep in mind. This is what high frequency traders will do to you as well. You get a hard level at 86 bucks. They want to take it through that whole number to shake out anybody who's trying to pick the bottom so a lot of people are buying that it was this double bottom we were talking about on friday 8601 they will often take the stock below 86 dollars knowing that they'll hit some stops if they get it to print 85.99 they hit those stops then you know and then they actually probably buy from those stop orders pick it up at 85 92 89 593 and then drive the stock higher which is exactly what they did the stock absolutely took off after just barely taking out that 86 level went straight up to 87 peeled back a bit closed at 88 this morning this is all over the news too believe it or not we've got three analysts talking about mcdonald's um we've got bernstein saying while well, they're encountering increased competition so they're a little bit bearish you got clsa upgrading the stock and you have rw baird that says the risk reward remains compelling. This is all from Fly on the Wall. So you have three analysts talking. Two of them are bullish. One of them are bearish. What do you think there? Uh, I think they're FOS, Dennis. I mean, <laughs> the stock has come down from 102. You got to use that $86 level as just major support. Kind of reminds me of that Wells Fargo back at 30. It is the number. We are a couple bucks away from there, but uh, we use that. If it stays above 86, this thing has a Great chance of taking back at least half of that move down from 102, perhaps go trade back in the mid-90s. Probably a lot of people short this stock, and uh, I would look for some follow-through here. 88.27 was uh, the high from Friday. Uh, we have traded above that in the pre-market. We've hit a pre-market high at Mickey D's here at uh, 88.48. So that's got a number to keep an eye on. But, Dennis, I mean, I don't eat a whole lot of fast food, okay? Maybe when we're traveling. But, like, do you, how do you decide whether you're going to go to Burger King or McDonald's or when? I mean, it's whatever. If, if you're traveling, you're on the road, it's whatever you see, whatever it's convenient, that's what you go to. Can you find those Burger Kings anymore? I know a couple closed <laughs> in my city here are the Burger Kings. McDonald's been eating their lunch here, no pun intended. Uh, 
So I don't know. If I'm on the road, I go through an airport, I always find a McDonald's, usually a couple of them, and often I don't find the Burger Kings. You, you, you don't find the other ones as much. So I think McDonald's is just always the food of choice just because it's so convenient. It's so cheap. You can go there, eat off that dollar menu, basically for five bucks, get full. And I think that's just, you know, if you're in a recession or if it's tighter for cash, McDonald's, despite, you know, the food not being probably that healthy, um... Yeah, and, and the whole movie that they Did had back in the day. Did I ever tell you my dad's prediction about uh, McDonald's? Oh, great. Let's give. I want to hear what your dad's prediction is. Well, he's what made a lot course. of, like, just like me, made a lot of good ones and a lot of bad ones. And uh, we were coming back from a swim meet with my buddy, and we stopped, and I think they had, like, 10-cent hamburgers and, then, <laughs> you know, nickel coffee. And <laughs> nickel my dad coffee. said, who in the heck is going to buy, you know, how is this company going to make it? Who's going to buy a greasy burger for 10 bucks and a weak Ten cup cents. of coffee for a nickel? <laughs> Ten that cents. one he was wrong one. He was wrong on that one, and also he didn't think television would make it. <laughs> we need to find out some more of your dad's so old predictions here, and I don't know if we should be fading. Your dad knew his horses. Maybe he didn't know his stocks as well, though, Joel. That's funny. Anyways, Dennis, we've got the other market We do have a couple other ones I just want to focus on. CNC here is uh, this is another health care provider. These health care providers are in the news every single day. There seems to be another one Holy in the news. Holy macro, down eight and a half bucks. Dude, this is getting rocked. It's it's crazy. You have, you know, we, we had, uh, last week we had a couple of them really getting rocked, obviously. Uh, then they were bouncing back. Now you got CNC getting rocked. they got problems in, in their Kentucky and Texas health plans. Uh, this is not a pretty chart here whatsoever, Joel. We've got that low here from the other day when it bounced down at 30.90. It's trading at 27 dollars right now. Best bit at 26. We got to go out to the weeklies to try to find support. There was a couple of lows here. I'm looking at 25.64 and 25.28, which was on uh, uh, which was on July or October the 7th. So. Right, I- Yep. It, yeah, so the, you want to look at those couple of lows. Even if we go back further, this whole 25 area has given some pretty good support in the past. This thing has went straight down. That would put it down over 11 bucks. So it falls another two. I think it could get a bounce off that 25. Maybe put a tight, well, you want to go too tight on something like this. But you always want to have a stop. You always want to have an out. So if it started trading 24.50, then I'd get nervous. But I don't know if it's going to get that low today, but that's kind of where my target would be is maybe that 25 area. Yeah, this is a tough one, Dennis. I mean, there's basically been like one trade, right? At this uh, 4380, 4,000 shares of trade in this. I don't know what. CNC? Uh, 20, yeah, 20, got... 27 bucks. No, no, no. I'm talking about the volume. Oh, the volume. Yeah, 4380. I was like, 4380? What are you talking about? It's not up 10 seven bucks. It's down some. Yeah, it's traded 4,380 shares. Yeah. would be confused, too. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what someone's basing that on, you know, to move a stock eight bucks like that, eight and a half bucks. So I'd, I'd keep a real close eye on 27 because that's the only number we have. I do see that those levels at 25 and a half. Uh, just on a side note, Dennis, I don't know if you had the opportunity to read Barron's this weekend. They're talking about Obamacare and the health bill and uh, the Supreme Court decisions. There's a lot of implications for a lot of health care companies uh, regarding that. It looks like it's going to pass, but folks, if you're holding health care stocks or anything related to what's going on in that bill, do your homework and follow up on it because there's uh, negative and positive ramifications for a lot of stocks in the healthcare sector. Yeah, there is, and you want to make sure you do do your homework. And Barron's is always a great source for uh, for a lot of people read Barron's. They get a pos- the stock gets a positive mention in Barron's. A lot of times it'll be up on the on the, in the on the Monday. So Barron's is just a great source of uh, information, and a lot of people read that, and it is an influential uh, uh, paper for sure. Let's talk about Apple quick here, Joel. We're going to run out of time. So what do you think? Oh, man, I hate when I'm bullish a stock and then I come in and it's up six bucks because I automatically want to short it even though <laughs> I was I, You know, it was strong on Friday. We talked about the relative strength of that stock all during the break when the spoos got under 1,300. I like this number right here, 586.30, Dennis. Uh, uh, what that does is that takes back. That's 50% of this entire move we had down from 644 down to 5. Uh, 28 and change. We're now going to consolidate here a little bit this 586 level. Uh, Really no major resistance going back up to 600. 
Uh, hopefully, this will peel back over the next day or two and get down to you know to the mid five seventies because uh, it's just hard buying this thing up six and a half bucks. Yeah, the pre market high, the pre market high, just real click to close down. It's got up to five eighty nine fifty five. So you got some nice sellers there, probably at that five ninety nice round number. I think you get chances on this. Maybe it peels back a bit. I do think this thing has 600 on its mind. I think eventually it is going to trade it. I don't know if I see it getting there today, but these things can go for crazy moves, so it wouldn't even shock me if it did. Uh, I think pullback should be bought in this stock. You can get it back at that 580. It may not be a bad idea. Obviously, you always use stops. We always stress that on the show. You want to know where your risk is, but I do think this thing could see 600 again in the near future. Okay, uh, just closing out. The S and P's are kind of hanging out down here, Dennis. Thirteen twenty-five fifty. Uh, the overnight low only trading three points above that. I'm anticipating just a couple runs at that number. You do have good support all the way down to thirteen twenty-three. So I don't think you can go out and start whooping the market until you get back on that. Also, Dennis, triple witch on Friday. Triple witch, yep. So you can expect some a little bit of volatility probably building up into that triple witch. And always on that triple witch expiration, there's always major volatility. So expect Friday to be a crazy day. Okay, Dennis, you have a happy birthday, and uh, folks, we'll be back with you tomorrow.